And we were looking at the fact that even though it was uh, translated as giants, it isn't uh, the word giant, it's uh, the word giga, which was actually means earthborn. And so these were creatures that were born on earth. They were a hybrid product of fallen angel and mankind. And it's generally accepted the most part uh, by most people that angels are male and whether or not that has anything to do with the fact that they don't procreate or whether it's because they're in a dimension where they don't procreate but um, somehow or other they when they came to earth they were able to naturally uh, enter into a relationship whereby they could procreate Um, and we do know from from Jude that they Uh, had left their natural body, the natural house, the body that they were living in, because the word was oiketerian. And that word is only used twice. And it is used as for our body as a new creation. And in this instance, whereby they had taken up this situation on the earth. And as a result, as a punishment, they have been chained up uh, in everlasting chains for their attempt to sabotage God's plan of redemption. We also looked at the fact that they said there was Nephilim in those days and afterwards. And we do know that after the flood, there were Nephilim. And we know that even as Joshua and the 12 spies and Caleb, that when they went out to spy out the land, they said there's Nephilim, there's giants in the land and the words Nephilim. So we know that they were very, very fearsome people. Angels in them of themselves, we know, appear in human form. Uh, they spoke and they ate with man. Uh, we see that when they turned up uh, and spoke with Abraham uh, at the tomb, whenever Mary asked them uh, the question and they answered them. And we know that they're capable of physical combat because one angel slaughtered 185,000 in one night. So we know quite a lot about the angels, um, but... We don't know the limitations of fallen angels with evil intent. We don't know if the the angels in heaven are simply obedient to God or or what all of the logistics are. Uh, We do know that demons seem to require a body and demons seem to be different from the fallen angels. There seems to be different categorization. Um, When they were cast out of the man at Gadara, uh, they asked to go into the swine and then they, they sent the swine crazy and went over the, the edge of the cliff. So we do know some things about the the angels, the demons, the fallen angels and the Nephilim, the hybrid. The prophecy that was given in Genesis uh, 3.15 actually declares two seeds. And just for, um, God says, I will put enmity between uh thy seed and her seed and we'll just read that Uh, i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel and we know that the seed of the woman is jesus christ but here we see that the other one is the seed of the serpent and this implies that the serpent will be the result of the offspring of the serpent in some way, shape, or form. And we went to Daniel 2.42. I think we did last week anyway, but I'm not sure. Uh, And if we didn't, we're going now. In Daniel 2.42, it says, and as the toes of the feet, and this is the the image of the, um, that Daniel had seen, and it was the image of the different uh, empires As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So we actually see here that there's there's a mixture between, we know that we are made out of the clay, but it says that the iron is going to be mixed with the marry clay, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So we see here that there's uh, something going to come in the final empire that is a mix of iron and clay. 
And we also know from Psalm 2 that there is a declaration of war against God by mankind. And it tells us there that why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So we know that mankind is going to make this declaration of war against God. But is there a connection between what is happening in the days of Noah and today? Because it tells us in Matthew 24, 37, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the days that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Are we living with the same carefree attitude towards God? And are we ignorant of what is looming before us? We looked at the the life and the, the lifespan of um, the time frame from Adam to Noah. Noah was born 1,056 years after Adam and had a lifespan of 950 years. And so he died 2,006 years after Adam. So we know that the Nephilim had taken control of much of the land and were a dominant force with a target objective to destroy the seed of Adam and thus prevent the Messiah from coming through the lineage of mankind, which was obviously that promise given to Eve. So we see here that it was uh, quite quickly that Satan began to try to contaminate the gene pool of the human race. So what is going on today? We're going to take a, a, a little look at it. Ray Kurzweil is the um, one of the leading names in science and technology. He's a, a pioneering inventor and a futurist. He is like the big name behind the coming singularity. He has accurately predicted to the year 80% of the predictions on technological advancements so the year that your smart tv came out he predicted the year everything that was forecast he said this is going to come out in 1995 2001 2012 he has accurately predicted virtually everything and the rest of it was pretty close but to the year he has predicted it in 86 percent of cases that is staggeringly high but he is the big name and he has promoted some credible advancements. So he has quite a good name. In scientific circles, he is honoured and revered uh, because he has done some work in areas like renewable energy, um, health, health and well-being. Um, but his primary field is in the advancement of nanobots and going beyond the medical advancements to promote inserting a machine that serves as an alternative. And that would mimic uh, our immune system to fight sickness and extend life expectancy. So this is the field that he's currently working in because the ultimate goal that he has is to... Um, toward the, the singularity. And so we're going to actually explain what the singularity is because so, some people might not have heard of it. It's the artificial intelligence uh, was first developed in actually 1950 by Alan Turing. And this uh, became known as the Turing test. And it's a test to measure when a machine can exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human and so the singularity in a nutshell really is whenever the the intellect of a machine uh, when we are expecting a machine to to think and do according to what we want I mean it's you see all the searches that you have on google that yeah. as soon as you search for something and then it automatically goes into everywhere else this is uh, programs that are put, being put together to um, streamline uh, all of those and that would be it at its basic form but what they're doing there is reaching the stage where there's a merging of intelligence and that's why they call it artificial intelligence 
And when they reach the stage where they're a match, the second they go beyond that to be able to procreate, that's the singularity. That's where they have become uh, alike, like us in ways that they're thinking and procreating. And um, it's when we reach that, that level of uncontrollable growth in technology and it's irreversible and it will result in unimaginable changes in human civilization. Mm -hmm. Now, Kurzweil acknowledges the risks of the abuse. Uh, and when he was questioned about it, he just compared them to fire and said that, like fire, it has the power to improve life and the power to destroy. Kurzweil predicts that the hybrid artificial intelligence will be a reality by the, the 2030s. That's when he reckons it's going to be up and running. And humans will be capable of tapping directly into the cloud. You know the way you can save things to the cloud right now? Well, you can. He says that you will be able to do this with your brain, your mind, uh, using a neocortex connection um, uh, from nanobots flowing through our bodies. We currently have in the region of 300 million neurons, uh, which will evolve our knowledge, he says, to the next stage of evolution. Would, would, you, would you agree that this sort of scientific development is altering the human DNA as we know it? I absolutely would. Yeah. 100%. Would, would, would you go along with the idea that this altification it, 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 it has already been placed in some people. Yep, absolutely it has. The Bible's very clear that the, this uh, singularity, this is not God's intent. Do you know what I was thinking as well there when you were speaking? I was thinking about, do you know when man fell in the yep. garden? Mm -hmm. And it was like a decline from there. Yep. Do you think that when Adam was walking with God, all of his brain was working to that full capacity and then through the fall and the decline that that kind of you know um decreased yeah i'd certainly uh, have quest i've asked that question thousands of times and mm. to myself i think that he certainly would have used uh, a greater capacity a much much greater capacity than what we use mm -hmm. and i believe that he had available to him but I actually believe we have it available too. We're just not tapping into it. My goodness. It's like, I find it hard enough to tap into what I've got. Never mind <laughs> the extra that's there. <laughs> Can you imagine being able to remember? And we apparently we all have perfect memories. We have just jumbled up the memories so that we can't access them. It's like uh, when you save stuff on your computer, some people can save it into lovely wee files and get no duplicates at all, and some people can't. Well, Adam the was the same whenever he saw the animals. He, yes, he was able yeah. to name them all. And so if you think about that, I mean, that was one of the evidences of him using, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the magnitude mm -hmm. of his brain. And the so, Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. Yeah, we, we yes. have. And that's for the here and now. And yep, very yeah. much as what Diana said, do you believe it? Uh -huh. Yep. That, that's I what I've been with, thinking about today. Yeah. Hmm? Which is why I believe we should be using far more of our brains than what we are actually using. Yeah. But can you see if you if you figure out how we can do that, will you let us know? <laughs> what you do? Me meditate on I have the mind of Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. And what about those ones that take dementia and they're not using, you know, their brain is getting less and less? Is dementia of God or is it is not? It you know? I definitely believe it's not of God. God. Exactly. So it's a word of the devil. And I think that. Uh, a lot of it comes back to what I was doing on Sunday really has uh, really, really has spoke to me. And I have been thinking a lot about the mind of Christ and how little we are using what we have and how how easily distracted we are from the the plan of God for our life. Because 
God didn't make any mistakes and he didn't make any substandard vessels. Every one of us, regardless of where we came from or what we've been through, we have the mind of Christ and we have the ability, therefore, because we are in him and he is in us. So the power and the energy that he has is available to us. But if we're tapping into the negative energy, we're producing in the negative rather than in the positive. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the yeah. issues that we have, and that's why we're not producing. And there's there's principles, and we're we're simply not using them effectively. And if we begin to to use them in the way that we're designed to use them, we will change the whole dynamics. Firstly, of our brain. If you listen to Caroline Leaf and the neuroplasticity of the brain, we grow our own brain cells. We don't whenever things are messed up in our brain it's because we've done it we've done it ourselves it's not that we're lacking in any level of intellect especially if we are born again we are not but what we have done we need to we need to uh, unscramble what we've scrambled up i think what we've done to our brain we got a great brain and we we did to our brain what a cap does the ball of wool I was just thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, when a, a bottle of wool gets all tangled up, yeah. and the time it actually takes to untangle something, you know, oh, well, wow. We don't That's have to good. untangle it to, in the way that it's a ball of wool because we have the Holy Spirit. And that was one of the, the questions that I was going to, to say with Kurzweil's um, hybrid whenever it comes into play. When he talks about having this... Uh, uh, evolving knowledge and um, this transhumanism when when he produces the first transhuman or cyborg or whatever he wants to call it. There are so many projects on the go with so many different names. Is it an attempt to replace the counselor, the Holy Spirit? Because this IA, this artificial intelligence, this is supposed to be our assistant, our help. Is this what Kurzweil is doing? That's a very, very valid point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember, Satan's always the counterfeit. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that as well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Always count he sets up the counterfeit. See, the, the technological singularity in transhumanism is connecting our central nervous system to a machine that is relatively boundless in its limits. When we are born again, we have been connected to the Holy Spirit. We have the mind of Christ, which is boundless. Diane, that was presented to us as children in a cartoon format of Pinocchio and always let your conscience be your guide. Your guide Remember? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. oh and it goodness. was his help. It was like a little bird. I forget what it was, the, the format actually, but mm -hmm. that was Pinocchio's conscience. And that's what this machine is the hybrid yeah except it isn't the conscience no it's not no but it's being yeah. presented as that format yes it's presented as being something positive so if we look at that what are the ethics how will altering our genetics through artificial intelligence or the technology of artificial intelligence or biosynthetics or nanotechnology affect our definition of being human how will it affect it? Or is it a repackaged form of eugenics? Sort of the, that which is real is really it's just like the practice of of improving the human species by selective mating. Um, or is it cloning? Uh, cloning is a different one, but it is that's why I was saying there's quite a number of different things because yes. cloning is a, a replication, it's a copy. Uh -huh. the improve the practice of improving the human species uh was used by hitler with selective mating to produce the aryan race mm -hmm. to uh destroy disabilities and uh enhance very specific desirable hereditary traits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is that what we're doing again because we all know how that ended yeah don't we transhumanism is imminent it's not 50 years away or 100 years away it's on our doorstep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i believe that probably laboratories have got things in them that we are not aware of yet mm -hmm. i don't believe that we'll be made aware of them until they're ready to tell us mm -hmm. they see 
transhumanism as an upgrade of mankind, like a morphological transformation into a hybrid that will redefine what it means to be human. Do you think the Antichrist is going to be that? I don't know. I know that the Antichrist is um, going to rise up and he's going to be some form of a, a seed of Satan. What mm-hmm. we know from scripture is that he is going to be exceptionally intelligent. Mm-hmm. He's going to come out of nowhere. He could be a transhuman. He could mm-hmm. uh, He could be a Nephilim, but he's he's not likely to be recognized as anything other than human because mm-hmm. it doesn't say that he's giant or anything, which would suggest that it's more likely to be uh, some form of a hybrid like transhuman. Also, one of the other things is that he comes back from the dead. Well, mm-hmm. transhumanism is a form of immortality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you know that his deadly wound was healed, and one of the things that they're working on is the, the regeneration of limbs and things like that, that they will regenerate mm-hmm. themselves. It's like a science fiction movie. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> What it's we happening. used to watch, yeah, we used to watch the Six Million Dollar Man and think it was great. Yes. We used to watch Star Trek and it was pie in the sky. And when yeah. you look at what's going on, it isn't. They were it actually isn't. using science. It's going beyond what God intended. It's way beyond. And in actual fact, I wasn't sure whether to bring this up now or whether to wait until we get to Nimrod. Oh, no, bring it up now, Diane. Well, we are. We I chose to bring it up now, but, but um, it is in keeping with uh, whenever when we come to Nimrod, we'll have plenty to do in Nimrod because there's quite a lot to do with Nimrod's DNA and all sorts of really interesting things. But it is so important that we know this now because we are in a time where there will be some sort of an event. Uh, it was something that was on one of the the documentaries. There's a quite a lot on transhumanism, and it was on a Tom Horn documentary. He had a doctor, or a bio, I think she was a biologist, uh, but she was uh, talking about uh, the introduction of transhumanism and that there would need to be an event. Now, this was a documentary that was written. I think they took about four years in making it, and it was released around about 2015. This was this interview took place between five and nine years ago. And she was asked how they would introduce uh, transhumanism into, you know, to become an acceptable thought mm-hmm. for consideration. She said uh, when she was asked the question that it could be introduced by one of two things. And one was a worldwide pandemic and the other was the possibility of the rapture, which would create uh, an EMP surge such as the world has never known and would that sort of a surge would uh, destroy all communication. Um, the ele- the electrics, the electronics, there would be no way to communicate with each other. You wouldn't be able to really function at all. Um, There would be complete blackouts and it would just be of such a magnitude that the whole world would be affected. I suppose a wee bit like what they talked about possibly happening in Y2K. I'm not sure that that could be the introduction to it because if it was that, then I don't see how their technology could work. That doesn't really fit with me. And bearing in mind that she had this interview between five and nine years ago, um, we now actually have one of those two scenarios in front okay. of us. There's just so much going on that we're just living our lives as though there's our biggest concern is whether or not we're going to get out mm-hmm. shopping at the end of the week because is there going to be mm-hmm. more restrictions on us when the the big mm-hmm. picture is much, much, much bigger and much more sinister, much mm-hmm. more sinister than any pandemic. This may be an interlude or an introduction, but what we have ahead of us, we need to be praying into and we need to be knowing about. What they're doing in the laboratories is they're creating an entirely new race of people. Once they bring in this genetic modification, uh, which is the intentional alteration of our DNA or, or RNA using 
biotechnology. They will bring it in promising cures for diseases, enhancement, um, the expansion of our life quality um, and quantity. I mean, they're promising immortality with this. Mm. And they have people cryogenically frozen. Mm. Uh, Kurzweil had has his father cryogenically frozen in anticipation of this uh, this answer coming in his lifetime. And there's there's many of the, the rich and famous have done the very same yes. thing. But there is actually a, another sim, sinister subset. And it's the merger of man and beast, some form of a chimera. Oh, my goodness. Now, they already have... They've already done this. This is not on the horizon. This has already been done. They have mixed, what they've admitted to is mixing the genes of humans and mice on the premise that if they can make the mice uh, more genetically aligned to humans, then the medical advancements will be uh, more accurate. And so any treatments that they produce uh, will be more accurate in terms of the outline. They, they will be able to find the the problems that are going to be associated with the side effects and things like that. There's a, a guy named Nick Bolstrom. Uh, he warned of these uh, these sensors that are they're they're realistic goals um, for these actual human based chimeras. They're actually on on the horizon. And he has been out warning of the um, the dangers of the, you know, like an island of Dr. Monroe scenario, scenario. Chris Putman actually spoke of the hybrids already existing for medical research. Um, you know, they're chimeras. The chimera. chimera. C-H-I-M-E-R-A. Chimera just means a cross. There used to be films made where they had crossed uh, like a monkey with a boy. I yeah. remember watching one. Um, so that's a chimera. A chimera is anything that's a mix, a hybrid of beast and man. What they're doing as well is there's a, a protein called antithrombin, and it can now uh, be grown in the milk of cows and goats by splicing in the human gene with, uh, with the, this animal. And this has become a really very lucrative business. It makes like multitudes, you know, it's really lucrative. And so this is being done uh, because this, for medical reasons, they can they can produce this medication uh, to replace that protein. But the difficulty is that once the super intelligence, the super AIs learn how to replicate, they will produce even more intelligent machines because once they learn to think and progress with their thinking it will redefine even the machine world their professed goal in promoting it is very noble they say it's to end poverty to end sickness disease disability mm -hmm. deformity even death and we do know that immortality is the ultimate goal so what are the dangers what are the dangers that we can see looming on the horizon with this my goodness. Well, one of the main ones is, you know, there'll be like multitudes of, of, of I don't know, beings running about that are not human, that don't really have a soul. God. What's that, Ken? They're trying to replicate God. Yeah, they're challenging God, aren't they? It's a Tower of Babel over again. That's exactly that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we'll actually see that the Tower of Babel isn't a a bunch of uh, Neanderthals building with a bunch of bricks. We're actually yeah. going to see when we get there that it's something completely different and very um, advanced. Mm -hmm. It's much more advanced than a lot of people think when they read Genesis. Yeah. But they're actually creating a race of people who we don't know what kind of beings they're going to be, but the race of people that they create are they going to view humans as a drain on society or even a threat? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you are, if they can uh, recreate limbs that have been injured and you require an operation, how valuable are you? Oh, yeah. The biggest thing is they're opening a Pandora's box. 
it's a name. They're yeah. mixing genetics in an unpredictable way, and there's no reference for it. When you open up your mind, there's gates. There's gates to the mind. When you open them up, anything can come through. Yeah. That's why the Bible says, do not drink to excess and do not uh, don't take drugs or anything that will alter the alter mind. Alter your mind. Yeah. And the thing about it is, it's not that God's been a killjoy. He knows that when you alter your mind, that's how mental illness gets in. You've yeah. opened the gateways up. And we have no reference for this Pandora's box. And here's the other thing, and you see it in all the movies, a species-dominant war between the opposing forces. Oh, yes, between the uh, subhumans and the humans. Yep. And this is predicted by 2050. Uh Uh-huh. And this is when they believe this is going to be the tipping point when it is believed that the natural human will have outlived its usefulness, making the AI uh, autonomous. The artificial oh intellect autonomous. It is predicted that there's going to be three groups of people. The cosmos who push to build godlike machines. Mm-hmm. Terrans who fight to preserve humanity's superiority. Mm-hmm. And cybergists, or guests, mm-hmm. cybergists, just I'm not sure how you say that, who will champion human machine integration, believing only this pathway can lead to utopia but will they be able to have like relations like us you know like male and female and what what will they give birth to what type of a of a child would they sort of you know give birth to well it looks if you've changed your dna then you will give birth to a hybrid you will give birth to a new race of people oh my goodness and they believe that uh, when they produce this, that they will uh, not require to eat the way we do um, with the same regularity. And they will able be able to go without uh, food and even water for weeks on end. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereby, if it is necessary, where they're going to be in military combat or anything, where they will not, their strength will not diminish as a result but there's a dr de garris believes that these three groups that were mentioned will clash <coughs> ideologically and militarily and inevitably give rise to ais that he calls artelects and uh what these will finally lead to the final world war oh, wow. uh, with the control of the planet being its prize and he reckons this will result in a what he calls a giga death, which is at least one billion people. If they were in war, can they be killed? I think there's a species that are coming up that will not be able to be killed. And the reason I say that is because of the plagues in Revelation. And it says that when one of the plagues is released, that uh, it will harm people for five months and they will want to die. They will seek death, but they will not find it. And so I think that there's some of them, that this will become a reality, but this will be in the the tribulation part. That's one of the plagues of the tribulation time. What about legal challenges that would be necessary in this new world? When you think about one of the things that we know is the power of our words, what has the, been the buzzword for the last six months? Yep, new normal. Yeah. Or re- reset. <laughs> reset, yeah. New normal is the buzzword that it's, yeah. we have to adapt to the new normal. Uh-huh. Do you know they're speaking forth something that is introducing the new world order? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what they're actually speaking yeah. forth because everything operates on earth in the same way. It's, it's spoken forth. To create. So what are the the legal changes that are going to be necessary? Because transgenic uh, and hybrid humans, including transhumans, will require changes to the law, like the legal definition of human. And here's a question. Is the stage being set through things like transgender redefinition? Yes, I was thinking we said We have actually (laughs) got this beginning. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. it's also going to become necessary to define the boundaries of human distinction what about law enforcement yeah but we 
if we look at the law enforcement again, you have the forensics. How are you even going to determine what how to use forensics whenever you have so so much <laughs> diversity? What about criminal profiling to account for animal traits? If you look at all of the uh, thrillers. Yeah. There's always mm -hmm. criminal profiles profilers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about yeah. human? What about the Bill of Human Rights? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is a fundamental protection of many things that I can see will just be absolutely ripped up or yeah. expanded to include genetically modified humans. But it is. It has already. That has already happened. Um, because human, the Human Rights Act was brought in to ensure that the Holocaust would never happen again and to preserve life as we know it. But if you look at how the Bill of Human Rights has now been changed to def, uh, redefine um, yes. transgender issues yeah. and yeah. what is normal, it has yeah. already been altered. Mm. But this will be bigger because this is. Um, in a completely new league. Mm -hmm. What about if you enhance like a prolific mass murderer like Ted Bundy with a wolf? Oh, good grief. Oh, please. That would be ghastly. That's <laughs> like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even and worse. Do you it's prosecute him as an animal or as a human? A maphrodite. <laughs> <laughs> In a court of law, what's he going to be prosecuted as? And who's going to be prosecuting him? Um, and what What's about going to be prosecuting him? Yeah, ex well, that's a very fair <laughs> point, Kim. What about even now there's arguments about uh, the strength of males and females and about those that have uh, uh, altered um, their gender? If you uh -huh. have a male that alters their gender and they must be accepted as female, they'll still have the same level of uh, testosterone that would be higher than any other natural female. And so their yeah. strength will be uh, significantly higher. And so they will have an advantage. So you've do already got the beginning of that. But are they not taking like sort of lifelong medication, you know, to yes, deal with they, that test? Yeah. Yes, but they still have a natural strength that would be significantly higher, maybe lower mm -hmm. than a natural mm -hmm. man, but it would be higher than a natural woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they have effectively placed themselves into that band of being a hybrid good grief what about i mean when we looked at the likes of um what we were talking about there if you get a criminal who is uh someone like we described if you get a savage animal and it rips somebody apart because it's it's a beast it's a wolf it's a lion it's a tiger mm -hmm. uh even a dog if you own a dog that's savage it will be put down if it harms someone. Okay. True. But what about someone who is a chimera, who's got savage instincts? Will there be protective laws to keep him alive or will he be put down? Will they reintroduce the death penalty? I mean, there's, it's absolutely, uh -huh. it's a minefield, isn't it? Sounds like it's going to be chaotic, very chaotic. I've, and what, what about global governance? Yeah, I've, Diane, I've just had a little look on the Transhuman Handbook. And when you hear what it, one of its arguments, it says transhumanism is the next logical step in the evolution of humankind. And this is what the author is saying. I am not only a transhumanist, but also a Christian transhumanist. Oh, oh good grief. Really? Who believes that Jesus was the first ever transhuman? Oh, 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 Can you oh, see how this is attack? It's already oh, wow. Deception. Isn't that great. unbelievable? That is unbelievable. How does he figure Jesus was? Is this because of the um, transfiguration? Probably, but I. This is this is what I think. What he's actually trying to do. It's an enormous deception. So mm -hmm. he's. A Trying to do, put a, a, an already an argument already out there to say, mm -hmm. you know, there will be people who rise up against transhuman transhumanism, and these Christians really don't understand it mm. because I actually think this is a, a a total deceptive remark and actually something 
and it's deliberately designed to to dissuade people from actually listening to Christians who would say, you know, stay away. Yes. From- yes. We, we have all of these with cloning cryogenics, which which is already happening. Um, people can, as as we speak now, select an embryo according to the expected height, weight, features, mm. and traits that will mm-hmm. close most closely match the adoptive parents, for want of a better terminology. Yeah. That um that has been frozen, right? So you go in and you get a catalog of these uh, frozen embryos you get a catalog to say this is the this is the makeup of this individual and then you choose one and then plant it into the woman's womb and the longest the one that has been frozen the longest was 24 years before it was inserted into the mother so this embryo was cryogenically frozen for 24 years and then it was taken out and put into a woman and it is now a child a living child a girl isn't it that amazing? Uh, CRISPR uh, is um, produces uh, CRISPR Cas nineteen clustered regularly interspersed short uh, palindromic repeats is what that stands for. CRISPR, which is designer babies, and they use uh, RNA strands that match the target gene sequence, insert replacement genes, um, effectively editing the DNA. But it goes way beyond disease eradication or gender selection. The germline model makes a permanent alteration to the species and begins a chain reaction in the genealogy. That means it's entering into a new species. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Even what about insurance implications? Will humans become too high risk? Or transgenics? What about animal abuse? When we reach the stage of these artilects, it is believed that they will be immensely powerful superminds. Um, they have an expectation that they will be a trillion, trillion times more powerful than humans. You can't even get that number on your head. Sure you can't. This brings us to CERN. Now, here's an interesting thing. About three or four years ago, we did um, a study in our group that included the transhumanism and the activities at CERN. The internet was riddled with information about what was exposing what was happening at CERN. I spent Mm -hmm. about four hours yesterday trying to find and recover some information on CERN. And you couldn't? There's zero. There's algorithms have been now been put in by Google, of which Ray Kurzweil is, is... very high up in, in Google and he was he was one of the orchestrators of and designers of it all. But they've got algorithms in there now and it does not matter what you do or how you do it. Perhaps some other people, but they weren't that hard to find before. And there are people who can find things that I can't find and I'm, you know, but they're not obvious anymore. They're not easy to find. And yep. there's no links to them. They're very, very, very well hidden. My goodness. So what what I have uh, is simply of a few things that I can recall from memory. Um, I would need somebody much better with computers than I am to find. But there were so many things. Mm-hmm. Even the, do you remember, Kim, we watched the, uh, the dance, the opening of Sir? Yes. Yes, remember I'd said about that and it was all based on, you know, the book of Revelation and what was about to happen. It was like an enactment out of that, wasn't it? It was. It was, and very, it was also very demonic. Very demonic. It's mm-hmm. gone. Uh, all of the things, see the things we watched three or four years ago? There's none of them there now. I was not able to find uh, any of the things that I was looking for. I knew what I was looking for. I've watched them before. Uh-huh. And I I came up with a, a big fat zero. But <gasps> CERN is one of a, a number of colliders around the world, but I believe to be the largest. Uh-huh. Um, <coughs> but its primary work is on uh, opening stargates and on time distortion, <coughs> opening portals into and entering into other dimensions. And their intent is to send something through it. 
and it went recently went through a multi-billion dollar upgrade to enable it to double its capacity. Um, it had already reached the height of, uh, it could uh, cause particles to, um, to explode. They could send it at the, the speed of light. I think Mallory probably has a better understanding of all of these things than I do of what's going on in CERN. There is a reason why God put boundaries around these dimensions or gates but this upgrade that they sent it away to do is to so that they would be capable of um dismantling the building blocks uh that are that are basically what they've called a, a wall they've discovered a wall that's holding back this darkness they want to have you know the black holes and all of the things associated with that so their purpose now is to discover the building blocks of this wall so that they can dismantle it and open up the portal. They have, even as far back as 2010, they actually simulated a smaller version of what they call the Big Bang. One of the things that um, had been on the internet was uh, the university quite close to the Collider in Geneva had reported disturbing behaviour and mental health problems in uh, a, such a significant number of the students that it was really alarming. I mean, it was like they were all really, they were being spooked. And, and even as we speak now, these things are being systematically loosed and unleashed on earth. What people thought were only legends are breaking into our reality. We, we just Diane, are going about our life. Diane, baby yeah. was saying... The, the Lord was uh, showing her about the end times mm -hmm. and uh, about the time whenever the angels that are in chains will be released. Yeah. That, would that be through CERN? Through CERN? Through CERN. Yeah. Absolutely. I think they're, they're opening up uh, something yeah. and they, they are unleashing demonic but, um, forces. Diane, yeah, did you you didn't happen to see that thing I sent you about Kevin's a sedan today? It's on the uh -huh. Zoom. Set. But I haven't also, seen it yet. No. Uh, he he also said that the um the Lord was releasing angels now to um we have to command those angels to, but they're going to be released onto the earth, you know. But he was saying that they're also going to the Lord is also going to be releasing angels yeah. here. And, so he, yeah. see, the Lord. The Lord wouldn't leave us defenseless, so he wouldn't, you know. No, he hasn't. He hasn't. <laughs> we we do not have to be worried about this. We just have to be wise. Yeah. And we have been given all authority here on earth. Yeah. And but we need to know what we're dealing with. Of course. If we're going to yeah. take authority over it. You can't take authority over something if you don't know what it is. Right. We, we yeah. can release the angels. It's only a matter of praying them and the being and the action. The scripture um, yeah. says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are to inherit salvation? That's right. Hebrews 1, 14. It isn't, uh, it isn't something to be alarmed about. We just need to be aware that these are the things that are going yeah. on because we do need to pray. Absolutely. We do need to pray and we, we need to, we have loved ones that are not saved and who have no idea of what is, yeah. is ahead. So yeah. it's it's not for alarm purpose. We know where we're going. We know what's going to happen to us. So we don't need to be worried. But it's just it's just that these things are going on as we speak. And one of the things that um, God says is that, you know, the people will be like they were in those days. And we don't want to be among those people that are ignorant of what's going on. No, we definitely don't. You know, so uh, so we need to... We need to take a hold of what's going on. That will lead us into verse 5 of Genesis 6. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, but finally, uh -huh. and we're going to finish, we're going to finish the, and even oh. enter into uh, chapter 7. Oh, dear, oh. That's the, way we are. the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted or repented that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And that has often been spoken of that, that God wished he had never made man. If you look at the, the Passion Translation, the notes on it, and if you listen to um, teachers that are knowledgeable teachers, like Sir Chuck Misler and that would speak on it, 
Um, it's actually the word Naham, which is uh, quite difficult to adequately translate into English. Uh, but I've uh, put down what, and it's quite similar to what Chuck Misler says, except it's easier to read than his version. But the passion says it is an expression of grief, of comfort, of compassion and hope all at the same time. God's heart filled with sorrow, compassion and hope, not simply anger. So it's not that he regretted it. It's just that it's a word that we don't really have an English equivalent to use. And so verse seven, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, verse nine is these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. Blameless and perfect, that's the word tamim. And it means without blemish. It is. It means sound, unimpaired, without spot. And it's a term that is referring to not being genetically contaminated. Wow. Okay, so this is not about Noah being obedient or good. It's about him, his genetic makeup, his DNA being not being tampered with. He's not one of the Nephilim. He's, he's a pure human, if you like. Now, I know that a lot of people teach that do believe that this is the case. They teach that he was the only human being, that his family were the only human being. It doesn't actually say that. Uh, there may have been others that were not genetically contaminated. Um, we're not actually told, but clearly Noah was the one who was listening. He was the one that was willing to walk with God and do what God asked him to do uh, because he was described as faithful. He had three sons, Shem, Ham and uh, Japheth. Shem means upright, brilliant, um, prosperity and dignity. One of the things that we looked at was the Sethite view in regard to the Nephilim. There are some rabbinical sources and some the same view would be in, embraced by some modern day Christians and especially those who claim heavenly visitations and they believe that the Sethite line was pure as in uh, Cain was evil and Seth was good. That goes against many things, not least of which the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there are no pure lines. There was no separation of the families at that stage. And besides, they, they actually also died in the flood. So there's a lot of things that stand in the, in the way of that. Another view that you will see promoted is that Seth was Melchizedek, um, but Melchizedek was without father and mother, and there's issues with that as well. But I just thought I'd bring it into the study just because it's there and it's a, a prevalent view alongside of the, the other views. Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. Again, we see here had corrupted their way on the earth. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God reveals his plan here to Noah and instructs him with a specific plan. In verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make the roof for the ark and finish it uh, to a cubit above and set the door in the ark on the side. Make it with lower second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood to, of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall die. Okay, so here we have the instructions. The material that he's to make it with is gopher wood. Gopher is actually a root word of the word gophrith, which is translated seven times in the Old Testament as brimstone. Hmm. Uh, 
in the context of being like God's fiery judgment on human wickedness. So that's interesting. I mean, it says in Genesis 19, verse 24, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, which was obviously the judgment. And Psalm 11, 6, upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. So it's interesting that uh, this was the material used. Pitch within and without, that's not a usual method. And it would indicate um, the intent that God had to preserve the ark. There are various theories that um, it ended up on Mount Ararat in Turkey. It's not the same as the mountains of Ararat. So there, the, the find has never been authenticated there. There's another theory that it's uh, on Elephantine Island where it is being a uh, kept as a protected treasure by the Ethiopians um, who believe uh, that it's watched over day and night. That's just a wee bit of background about what, where it is today or where it may be. So it says about covering at both sides. The word cover is the Hebrew word kafar, which literally means to cover and by extension to insulate or to atone for. It's used in the law or the Mosaic law to describe the process of the high priest making atonement for the sins of the people by covering the sin, sins as if thereby protectively insulating the people. It's what is done in the day of atonement or Yom, Yom Kippur. A related and similar word for pitch is, or gopher, it most often in scripture describes uh, a covering payment of a ransom for one's life or that of an entire village. Isn't that interesting to do with the ark? You don't see all of those things in the English translation, sure you don't. So we see here that there's the picture of redemption, of atonement, and uh, we see the also the message of judgment in the material. Uh, the materials used to construct the ark convey protection from the judgment for those on the inside, so they got protection from the floodwaters and there's a deeper layer, obviously, the protection against judgment in the afterlife as well. The dimensions of the Ark. The Ark is believed to have been approximately the size of the Titanic and was three stories high. Uh, if we take a cubit as 18 inches, there are discrepancies. People have argued about the exact amount of a cubit, but there's a general uh, thought process that it's 18 inches or give or take. That would make it approximately or roughly 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It had a single door, which represents the type of Jesus. There's only one way to enter in to redemption. Amen. Uh, so that would be the indicator there. Verse 18 says, I will establish my covenant with you. And shall you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives, and you, and every living thing of all flesh, and you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, and of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. And Noah did this, and he did all that God commanded him. Amen. Some have suggested that God put the animals into a deep sleep, like a, a state of hibernation. But mm -hmm. Noah wouldn't have had to have needed to bring food for them if that was so. Because it says it shall serve for food as food for you and for them. So that's just a wee note on that. Genesis 7, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy household into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens, the males and female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, male and female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, and the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. The Animals that he had to take in by twos were for procreation to keep the seed alive on earth. 
And the clean animals that he talks about were to go in as in sevens and they were going to be used for sacrifice whenever they are landed. Anybody got any thoughts on tonight on what we've been doing? Anything we haven't covered yet? Any comments? It is. Sorry, Diana, because I was just watching it while I was listening to you as well. And there's a Christian guy who's actually got it up and he's actually telling you what, I'll post that one, he's telling you what they're actually doing. They're enacting right. sort of, you know, a demonic type of ritual yeah. that um, Satanists do, you know, in groves, that they actually do in groves. And it must be a type of satanic worship but they're actually enacting that out well that's yeah. where the the false gods in the bible did all their worship was in the groves um because they were instructed to tear down the groves in scripture it's actually it oh see when you watch that it's actually quite scary you know to actually see those people they're like zombies too yeah when they're enacting it out you know it's like they've it's like they're not in their right mind or something you know, I, I do scary. believe that many of them have given their mind over to Satan. I think some have actively done it and others wouldn't take too much of a push to get them to do it. Um, they're, they're power crazy and they do believe that they're like they did at Babel, that they will become like the Most High God. Or are we really dealing with something we have to come in head on and fight and just uh, take authority over? the works of Satan and know it, you know, call it out for what it is. I think the problem with it is that um, it requires God's intervention as it did with Babel because he sent and he uh, dispersed the languages, to, uh, confused the languages and dispersed them into nations because he said nothing would be impossible for them. Uh, they would be able to do anything and I believe this is a replication of what they were doing back then mm -hmm. because the, what they were setting up was some form of astrological uh, yeah. thing into the heavens. I know we need to, to be very prayerful about it, but the authority level, they have subjected themselves to the God of this world. And the Bible says that they are going to achieve their goal. So I think we need to... <sighs> uh be wise and ask the holy spirit what way we are to pray about this mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, because it, the times are um th there's things going on now that n the world has never seen mm -hmm. you know, and even when we look back on the times of the nephilim and the rephaim uh the in the natural the likes of the pyramids and that for mankind to build that would be have been impossible because even it, today it would be extremely difficult to be able to lift the kind of stones the magnitude of what they were lifting in those days and the uh, dimensions and precision of those pyramids and the direction of the sun suggests they're perfect mathematically uh-huh there's such a, per, you know, it's, they shouldn't have had the knowledge in those days. No, absolutely. And so that would indicate uh, an intellectual level that we are not attributing to them. And we should be, we should recognise that somewhere along the line, their intellect was not uh, as we would know it. They didn't have the technology, so their intellect was something innate, something that came from a DNA gene. And we know that Satan is is clever. Mm -hmm. He may be prideful, but he's also clever. He's a strategist, and he knows what God planned, and he knows what's written in the heavens. And he can quote scripture for his own agenda. Absolutely. Quantumly speaking, if we entangle ourselves with God, then mm -hmm. the flow of prayer will come out in uh, an effortless ease of peace, and then our declarations will be... Uh, authoritative mm. most of yeah. our time in prayer should actually be spent entangling with him we should be mm. entering into prayer looking at uh first go in with a an attitude of gratitude look at psalm 100 yeah. enter in through his gates with thanksgiving and praise in your heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so if we uh entangle ourselves with with who he is 
yeah. it changes the dynamics of your prayer because what we were saying on Sunday was talking about the fact that we are a vibration mm -hmm. so if we get into the right wavelength God's wavelength by entangling ourselves our vibration we are in the right wavelength we're on the right frequency and then when you're in the right frequency what you say is authoritative mm -hmm. if you imagine it much like when you would have be where you had to tune in your radio I know we don't have to do that these days but mm -hmm. well you used to have to turn the knob and keep on back and forth and back and forth until you got the, the signal yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that's kind of what we're doing that part of entangling with him until you get into that part where mm -hmm. it's clear and you yeah. get that word from heaven. See, once you get the word from heaven, nothing yeah. will stop you because you've got that. the connection yeah. and you get the word from heaven. You get that, yeah. that explosion on the inside of you. Whereas we're too quick to go in and then we're not in the right frequency. And so if we're, if we're feeling anxious, that mm -hmm. is, uh, that's God's way of letting us know you're not in the right frequency. Get on the right frequency before you start entering into the prayer for the for your giving your request to make your request known to him. But we we if we're at a disconnect from him, then yeah. there's an anxiety. When we get into that effortless flow, that's when we have the yeah. authority. The authority yeah. isn't there if we're out of a frequency with him. So um so yeah, I think that I think we need there's. I think prayer has been mistaught or not even taught in some churches, some places. Uh -huh. You know, we need to we need to learn how to if if what we're doing isn't working, uh -huh. we need to go back to the drawing board and find out why. Uh -huh. If the Bible says every prayer is yes and amen, and we're not getting yes and amen, yeah. then we need to revise what we're doing. It changes things. It changes you. That's what it changes yeah. most. More than it changes anything else, it changes you. Yeah. Because I know that um, the strength that I have gained uh, from it and the, the revelation that I've got from it, because the revelation doesn't necessarily come when I'm praying. It could come later on. It could come during my studies. It's, but it has become very explosive, the different things that are happening. So...